And you and I know that it takes two working parents, sometimes two jobs by each parent, to, to pay the bills and keep the food on the, fa on, on the table. Uh, so, so these are, are very serious concerns and, and ways that we need to fight back and, and uh, stand up for the women of America. Now, Congressman Maloney, I know you might have to run, but I just wonder, and I appreciate you standing here with me tonight, because I, I think that the people of America, Mr. Speaker, need to hear from a, a person like yourself, Congressman Maloney, who has been laboring in the vineyards of economic and civil rights, both. Uh, you know, you know, for a few years now, you know what you're talking about. You've been up, been doing this work. You've served the community for many years, and I just want to see if I can uh, get your views on another issue, and that is that one of the things the Republicans are, have been doing is as, er, is having this this program to cut, cut, cut government services, which of course has led to uh, reductions in public employees, uh, and so for example. Um, uh, while, while the private sector has added about 1.7 million jobs over the last 12 months, uh, of course, during the Bush administration, we were losing jobs, the public sector has lost about 400,000 jobs. When you consider the fact that women are disproportionately likely to work for the public sector, their employment decline has, uh, has, has, uh, uh, has been particularly hit when public sector employees get laid off. So I just I want to keep connecting the dots uh, tonight, if I may. We started out the conversation with the cuts to women's health in this, this deceptively entitled bill, the, the so-called, I don't even want to repeat it because it's so wrong, but the Protect Life Act actually is to protect, not, not to protect women's lives act. You right, know. that's a better name. <laughs> right. Uh, but but then, it, then we move on to uh, the e uh, cuts to uh, important programs that older women are disproportionately uh, relying on. We move to the wage gap, and now we're seeing that these cuts to public uh, employees are falling more heavily on the shoulders of women. You know, what, what is, you mentioned an agenda. Are we really talking about an agenda here, not just a single program, but a whole agenda? I yield to the gentle lady. Well, the gentleman is correct to, correct, to connect the dots, and you're absolutely to correct that when you cut um, education and health care, these are the two areas that women are uh, employed Working. in pre predominantly. And uh, in many cases, they have achieved leadership positions in these two fields. Yet these are the two areas that have been cut the most uh, in the municipal area across the country that have hurt our states and our, and our cities. And the gentleman is very correct to point out that you cannot cut your way to prosperity. Uh, many economists have come out in support of President Obama's jobs bill, including two Nobel laureates. And one economist uh, uh, that I like to uh, read because he is employed by the private sector, which means if he's wrong, he's going to get fired. And he was a, a Republican economist in that he was the chief uh, analyst for uh, Senator McCain when, when McCain ran for president. And this is uh, Mr. Zandi. And Mr. Zandi said that uh, President Obama's uh, economic plan, the jobs bill that he's put out, would create next year 1.9 million new jobs, add two percentage points to the GDP, and uh, also cut the unemployment rate by at least 1%. I, I use his numbers uh, uh, since he was Senator McCain's uh, advisor and economist, but there is a drumbeat of economists across the country that are saying you cannot cut your way out of a recession and that we are getting dangerously close to a double dip when you combine all these massive cuts with what's happening in Europe and the instability uh, with uh, the country's finances and certain of our allies. And uh, this is an extreme, uh, extreme challenge here at home. And economists uh, have uni universally said that we need to invest and continue to work to get the economy moving by investing in job-creating areas, such as the infrastructure bank such as bu rebuilding our bridges and, and, and making sure they're safe. One part that I particularly like as a former teacher is the plan to rehab schools 
and make them ready for the 21st century. That will employ people across this country and invest in making our schools appropriate. I know that in, even in the great state of New York, some of our schools are not properly wired for computers. Mr. Ellison, when you and I were in school, all you needed was a pencil. But our, our, today, our young people need computers. Uh, we, they are competing not with the people in the class, but with people around the world. Right. And they need to, to have high-tech access, and our schools have to be wired uh, for the 21st century. And the investment in uh, creating good jobs by uh, building high-speed rail to, to move us into the 21st century and repairing our infrastructure uh, with our roads and our, and our uh, uh, trains and in so many ways. And, and also making sure that our teachers and our police and our fire are, are not laid off during this recession uh, when we need to invest in, in helping America. Everybody tells us, every economist will tell us the best investment we can make for the future of our country is to invest in education. We can't afford to be uh, not competitive with modern schools and not com competitive with the, the proper number of teachers so that our classrooms are not so overcrowded. So that is a particular area that I like in this uh, particular jobs program. Yeah, I like the jobs bill as well. Uh, it's too bad that uh, the American Jobs Act did not get, uh, was able not even to be debated in the Senate uh, the, yesterday. I mean, you would think that we could debate the bill at least. I mean, I mean if, if, if Republicans have different ideas about job creation than, than we do as Democrats, I'm okay with that. Let's debate it and let's get it out on the floor. But they don't even want to have the debate. And I think that, you know, before we, you know, you mentioned public sector getting support. Well, I, I just would like to applaud what you just said. I truly do believe that there is no idea that is so frightening or threatening that it can't be debated in the United States Congress. And so I agree with you. Let's have a debate. The president has put forward his program. Let's see what the Republican program is. Let's bring it down, have it debated, and let's have the economists across the country and across the world weigh in with which program is going to get the economy moving and move us with greater strength in the growth of our economy. Well, Congressman Maloney, as you, as you know, you know, the president challenged them, the Republicans, to, to, to do this. He said, look, uh, I'm, I'm putting my bill up here. You bring yours up here, and we'll see which one creates more jobs. And, and, and folks like Mark Zandi, an economist who has advised both Republicans and Democrats, took, it, took an evaluation. He said the Republican plan is not likely to create any jobs next year. Well, people are employed this year and next year. And what are they doing about it? Well, they're just cutting basic uh, services and local government. They're, they're getting rid of health regulations of the EPA. They're doing, this, they're doing things like going, they're creating cultural fights like the one they did today, trying to sort of divide Americans based on people's deeply held views about the issue of abortion, when we need to be getting people back to work, which is, a, a, in my view, a, a try to take our eye off the ball. But I just wanted to throw out a couple of facts that I think may contribute to the dialogue. Here's one. In September 2011, just the month that just passed, the public sector lost 34,000 jobs. 82% of those jobs were women's jobs. This is an important fact. This is according to the National Women's Law Center. And then also, the damage in public sector was driven largely by cuts to local government education. Say that again. And, you, and, and Congressman Maloney, you're, you're a former teacher, so I know this is close to your heart. The damage in the, sec, in the public sector was largely by cuts to the local government education. Uh, the, and in this field, one that is nearly three-quarters women, 24,400 jobs were lost from August to September. Since the recovery began in 2009, this field has lost more than 250,000 jobs. What does it mean when we, when, when we as a society disinvest in public education? Well, one thing it means is that women workers will be hit harder because that's who three-quarters of who our teachers are. But it also means that our young people will be deprived. I mean, as a person who's been in the classroom, Congressman Maloney, I mean, what does that mean when a classroom goes from 20 kids 
to 35 kids. What does it mean to the kids who might not be catching on to the lesson or who may have a learning disability? I mean, is it even possible for a competent, caring teacher to teach all the kids, given that some, you know, may need extra help? I yield to, 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 to you, Congressman Maloney, for your views on this. Oh, well, th there is scientific data that as schools are overcrowded, the, the quality of, of the teaching goes down. Uh, but uh, that's very troubling when you talk about uh, hemorrhaging so many jobs. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there are 14 million people out of work mm. and 3 million jobs that are out there now. So if we could miraculously uh, fill those 3 million jobs overnight, there would still be 11 million Americans out of work and looking for jobs. For every job opening, there are five people at least standing in line for that job. And what I find particularly troubling is that many of these people are young people that have invested in their education, they have taken out student loans, they are burdened with huge student loans, and they can't find employment. Uh, so they are, they are facing a, a terrible situation. And studies show that if you can't find employment in the early years of your career, it affects your earnings and your self-confidence and your productivity for the rest of your life. So for no fault of theirs, they are, they are confronting the worst, really the worst employment uh, situation in my lifetime and uh, really in decades. So we need to work together. If there was one area that the Republicans and Democrats should work together, it's in creating jobs and moving our economy forward. But regretfully, some people don't want to do anything until the 2012 election. But the people who are out of work, they can't afford to wait till 2012. W it's well, really incumbent on us to act now to help them. Well, Congressman Maloney, you, you just mentioned a moment ago uh, this, this idea of, of reinvesting in our schools. Today, I um, had a visit from a number of uh, superintendents in my state of Minnesota, and uh, they were not all from the 5th Congressional District, which I'm honored to represent, but they were from a cross-section around the state. And, and they told me that there were literally uh, nearly 100 different school districts going to the voters for a referendum so that they could pay their basic expenses because the state government is backing off its commitment to education because the federal government is backing off its commitment. I mean, the fact of the matter is, this, we have a disturbing trend here. And they told me, they said, look, you know, if we could just get the part of the American Jobs Act passed that would help us with these old and outdated and rupturing boilers, uh, these old beat up pipes, uh, these poor ventilation, windows that are not opening and closing properly. If we could get some help with our capital budget, we, that would free up money for us to hire teachers and really do some real instruction. I mean, I mean, what do you think about that part of the American Jobs Act, which, which goes to this issue of, you know, investing in our schools and invest in hiring our, te keeping our teachers out there, hire, preventing 280 thousand teachers from being laid off. What do you think about this, this idea of, of really just making sure the facilities of our infrastructure of our schools is sound for our kids and the people who work in the school? Well, well you focused on really one of the critical parts of the President's uh, jobs proposal, modernizing our, our right. schools. And not only would it help you through this period by creating jobs, good paying jobs to modernize the schools and keep the teachers working, and I would say the police and fire. Yeah. Uh, and, and it also invests in, in a better education, a better environment for our young people to, to learn and grow and to modernize them to the extent that they are wired appropriately uh, for the 21st century. <laughs> so these are, these are important areas that we need to work, look at and, and think about. I also want to point out the unemployed. Uh, the, the, we, the jobs aren't out there. So when you don't continue the unemployment insurance, th there is no hope for these people. It's better for them to continue looking for a job and, and continuing trying and not to give up hope so that they continue 
uh, working towards that end. So I, I just want to tell you how much I enjoyed uh, sharing uh, with you uh, information on, on, on the jobs program for the president and really how the, um, the opposition, uh, our friends on the other side of the aisle, their agenda to keep women down and back, disproportionately cutting programs that aid women, disproportionately uh, going after their, literally, their constitutional rights to make the choices that are legal uh, in our country and which provides the best, best health care for them. So the Progressive Caucus has always stood up for, for women, children, and families, and I want to uh, thank you and the well, caucus for, for, on a programmatic way, uh, standing up for women, children, and families and for also organizing the special order. Well, I yell back. Well, thank Congresswoman you. Maloney, I, I know that you, you have to, uh, to take care of other important responsibilities, and I want to just thank you because let me, I just think it's important, Mr. Speaker, for people to know, you know, Congressman Maloney is the author of the Credit Card Holders Bill of Rights Act. Uh, when, you, when you go and use your credit card and don't get back a bunch of fees and stuff you didn't even bargain for, terms being changed without any notice to you, when you use that credit card and if you're late on one card, sometimes they'll even, they used to jack you up on the, other, on, on the card you weren't even late on, because you were late on some other card, then they're not taking, they can't do that anymore. When people benefit from credit card justice, you, you have to thank Carol Maloney. You cannot uh, just use that card and, and say, wow, things are better than they used to be with this card. Well, they're better because Carol Maloney fought tirelessly, and, and this was an uphill climb for you. It was not easy. You had to work on editorial boards. You had to work on Republicans. You had to work on Democrats. You had to work on the Senate. You had to just pound the pavement night and day, and yet you got that done. And this country cannot pay you back for the good work you did. And, and Congressman Maloney, I, you know, um, I wish you many, many, many years here in this Congress, but no matter how long you stay here, I, I just want you to know that that accomplishment is a towering achievement which will stand the test of time and is historic. So um, I don't want to hold you because I know you got to go do some important things, but I just didn't want you to leave without, without Mr. Speaker, uh, me mentioning how important that service that you gave was. Not to mention the work you do every single day, uh, including the work you do on the Joint Economic Committee on rights of all people, on women's rights. So uh, I, I just want to thank the gentleman uh, for, your, for your statement. Uh, the Credit Card Holders Bill of Rights, according to the Pew Foundation, uh, saved consumers over $10 billion in the last uh, year by cutting out uh, unfair, abusive, deceptive practices. And I'm using the terms from the Federal Reserve. And uh, I'm, I'm proud that it helps uh, Americans better manage their credit. And no longer can people raise rates any time, any reason, retroactively on their balances. Uh, trapping them really in a never-ending uh, cycle of debt. I had many constituents who had purchased items and they had paid so much in interest over the time that they could have paid for the car or the washing machine, yet they still had not paid it off. And this is wrong and unfair. And central to this bill, it gives consumers uh, the, the opportunity and the right to make a decision. So if they're going to raise their rate, they must notify them, and the consumer has the choice of whether they opt into a higher rate or pay off their card and go to another provider that may have a lower rate. So it puts more competition in the system, has lowered the, the interest rates, the fees, and really helped consumers. And I want to say, as we were co-chairs of the Consumer uh, a committee caucus. We started that yes, uh, right. really to build support for the bill, and you were a strong part of, of helping me pass it. And it was difficult, but I'm proud that the president signed it into law, and it is now benefiting Americans and bringing more ability for them to control their own, uh, their own, uh, their own uh, businesses, their own assets, their own uh, credit. And I must say, really, this was a when it did pass the House, there was strong Republican support for it. Yes, there was. In, in both the House and the Senate, and, and I'm pleased that our Americans have this, this added uh, benefit in their lives. Thank you so much for your leadership. It has been a pleasure to join you tonight. Thank well, you. Well, let me thank you again, Congressman Maloney, and you have a wonderful evening.
And again, thank you for all of the great work you've done, and thank you for your help tonight. I'm just going to remain uh, a few more minutes to help the American people understand what is in the American Jobs Act. The American Jobs Act is an excellent piece of legislation. We've been talking a lot tonight here at this Progressive Caucus uh, uh, special order uh, about women's rights, but we've also been talking about jobs. And of course, these subjects go right together. Uh, it, it's important, uh, to, as we talk about this uh, subject tonight, that the American people know what's in the American Jobs Act. The American Jobs Act will put Americans to work when jobs are needed, which is now. Not later, not next year, not some other time, now. The emphasis of the American Jobs Act is immediacy. It will preserve and create jobs now. It will put money in the pockets of working Americans now. It will give businesses job-creating tax breaks now. And it will provide a boost to the economy right now. So this is what we're, the, what we're aiming for in the American Jobs Act. Republican colleagues have failed to produce any kind of a jobs bill. Uh, the only th time they ever talk about jobs is when they're not talking about jobs. They say that cutting uh, important health uh, regulations will create jobs. They won't. They say that cutting taxes for people uh, at the very top of the American income scale, uh, corporations, uh, will, will create jobs. It won't. Corporations already have, are awash in corporate profits. They're not using the money to create jobs, and they won't use the money even if we give them more money because what they don't have is customers. Why don't they have customers? Because people aren't working. Americans need to be put back to work, and when businesses find that they have customers and orders, they will hire people to fill those orders. When they have excess capacity, when, when, they're, when uh, they're, they're not going to uh, just hire people. They're going to hire people when they need to hire people because they got sales that they need to make. Of course, this is a basic and fundamental difference of opinion that we have with our Republican colleagues about how the way the economy works. I, but I do believe that after years and years of trying, trickle-down economics must be discarded, must be dismissed, must be, must be thrown away as a discredited economic theory trickle-down economics, which is the Republican mantra. They believe in trickle-down. They believe if you give rich people enough money, maybe the money will trickle down to the rest of us. This has been a failed economic policy. They are wrong. They have been proven to be wrong, and yet they never stop coming here saying, if we just gave the rich people another tax cut, if we just gave the rich corporations who don't pay any taxes now more money, if we just gave them more money, all those profits that they have, they might maybe hire somebody. They're wrong, and the history has proven them to be wrong. I don't know why they cling to this outmoded, discredited, discarded theory of economics, but they, 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 kick, they cling to it. The American Jobs Act would do something different. It would put people back to work, and with people in working again, this will boost aggregate demand, aggregate meaning added up, cumulative demand, and with that, more customers, more people with money to buy and spend, this economy will take off, and the store will hire people because they will have a reason to. So the American Jobs Act goes right at the problem. But here's the other thing. The American Jobs Act calls it a Jobs Act, and it is. But there's something also very important that the American Jobs Act does that I wish got more play. It invests in our nation's basic infrastructure. It invests in our nation's human capital. It puts targeted tax breaks, not just giving money to rich people and corporations who have plenty of money and who won't use it to hire people, but it gives targeted tax breaks and puts money in the pockets of, 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 of American workers and American employers so that they will add and grow jobs. And uh, it, it puts money into job training, which and that it does skill upgrades for our people so that they are more productive and better at what they do. Um, the, the job saving and job producing actions will put paychecks into the economy, will provide vital economic needs, and invest in economic growth. I just want to quote Mark Zandi for a moment, who's this economist who works for both Republicans and Democrats. He is unbiased, and here's what he had to say. He says, quote, President Obama's job proposal would help stabilize confidence and help keep U.S. from sliding back into recession, add two percentage points to GDP, and add 1.9 million jobs and cut the unemployment rate by a percentage point. Now, that's a big deal. Wouldn't the people 
uh, watching this show, Mr. Speaker, like to be able to see America go from 9.1 percent unemployment to 8.1 percent unemployment? I think this would be great. And here's the big, best thing about the American Jobs Act. It's paid for. Unlike the two wars that the Republicans got us into in the last decade, unlike the big pharma giveaway Medicare Part D, unlike the tax breaks that uh, under the Republican, under George Bush and the Republican majority, this, the American Jobs Act is paid for. We, President Obama has offered pay fors in this which cover the cost of the bill. This is something the Republicans are not used to, which is why they may not quite understand the American Jobs Act. They, they like to spend money that we don't have. That's what they did with the two wars, Iraq and Afghanistan. That's what they did with the uh, Bush jet tax cuts. And that's, of course, what they did uh, with the big pharma giveaway. But this bill is, is paid for. The American Jobs Act is paid for, which may be why they don't support it, because they don't understand things that are paid for. They just understand spending and adding to the deficit. But the Republicans have not only failed to produce or support any jobs bill of their own, other than just absurdly claiming that uh, getting rid of important health regulations is going to create jobs, they're refusing to even act on the American Jobs Act. In fact, Majority Leader Eric Cantor has already said the Jobs Act was dead, his word. The Republicans not only failed to produce or support any jobs bill, they're refusing to act on this bill. And, 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 and I think Eric Cantor has also said it was unacceptable, is another word that he used. Now, that's, again, fine with me. If, if the majority leader could say, look, I don't like this part, but I can maybe go for that part, let's get the bill up here, offer amendments, debate this thing, but by all means, let's start talking about jobs around here. The Republicans are more invested in protecting millionaires from paying their fair share than helping their middle class to work. By a 16-point margin, Mr. Speaker, the Americans support the President Obama's proposal to create jobs, 52% to 36%. 52 percent of Americans want it, 36 percent of Americans don't. By a 16-point margin, Americans support President Obama's proposal to create jobs. By a 15-point margin, more Americans trust President Obama to do a better job creating jobs than congressional Republicans. 49% to 34%. 62% of all Americans, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, and of, of all, at least 62% of the people surveyed support a balanced approach. That means cutting spending and raising revenue to reduce the deficit. And, Mr. Speaker, three out of four Americans support raising taxes on Americans with incomes of $1 million or more. These are the so-called job creators Republicans like to talk about. Only problem is they haven't been creating any jobs. But what will create jobs is businesses and small businesses that, that, that have orders and have consumers and have people working and have people who have money to spend at, the job, at, the, at their businesses. That's what will create jobs. I think it's important, Mr. Speaker, to point out to the American people that, you know, the three components of the American Jobs Act uh, are designed to win. One, the American Jobs Act and reinvesting in America, preventing up to 280,000 teacher layoffs and keeping first responders, firefighters, and police officers on the job. Two, modernizing at least 35,000 public schools across the country. Mr. Speaker, myself and, and Congressman Maloney were talking about this. She's a former teacher. She, we were talking about supporting new science labs, internet-ready classrooms, school renovations, both rural and urban. But as I talked about earlier today, the superintendents who, in the schools that I represent, some of them have boilers that are about to go out, windows that aren't fixed up right, uh, you know, roofs that need repair, basic stuff. This would put thousands of Americans back to work as we give our young people a good, decent place and a modern place to go learn in. Of course, another part of, 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 of the American Jobs Act, all under, all under this important... Uh, uh, a category of, of um, investing in America is making immediate investments in infrastructure, modernizing our roads, our railways, our airplanes, putting hundreds of thousands of American workers back to work. Rebuilding, Project Rebuild, a great effort, an effort to put people back to work, rehabilitating homes and businesses and stabilizing communities, leveraging private capital and scaling up successful models of public-private collaboration. 
and of course expanding wireless internet expanding wireless internet to 98 percent of Americans and first responders by freeing up the nation's uh, spectrum the second element of this important American Jobs Act which Republicans should support and Democrats do support is tax cuts for employers and employees now this is not just some given giveaway this is targeted tax cuts that are designed to succeed some of my friends on the Republican side of the aisle like to say Democrats don't like tax cuts this is not true we are for tax cuts when they are targeted and designed to help the average working American not just some giveaway to rich people and of course I have nothing against rich people I like rich people um, in fact you know one day when I leave Congress and get a go back to the private sector maybe I can be one of them but the fact is is that right now right now the fact of the matter is is that we need tax cuts that are targeted and designed to spur the economy not just giveaways hoping and praying that the money will trickle down specifically what I'm referring to mr. speaker is cutting payroll taxes in half for 160 million workers next year the president's plan will expand the payroll payroll tax cut passed last year to cut workers payroll taxes in half in 2012 providing fifteen hundred dollars a tax cut to the typical American family without negatively expanding and impacting Social Security trust fund this is important because you know we things are tough around around the house things are tough around the the kitchen table and Americans could really use this particularly now it will help maintain aggregate demand and it would be very helpful also mr. speaker allowing more Americans to refinance their mortgages at today's near 4% interest rates which can put more than two thousand dollars a year in a family's pocket also mr. speaker cutting the payroll tax in half for 98 percent of businesses the president's plan will cut in half taxes paid by businesses on their first five million in payroll mr. speaker another important uh, element of the American Jobs Act that has to do with this tax issue is a complete payroll tax holiday for added workers or increased wages the employment ploy, excuse me the president's plan will completely eliminate payroll taxes for firms that increase payroll by adding new workers or increasing wages that's a targeted pay tax cut that's a tax cut that's going to get people to hire somebody not just some give it give money to rich people and hope that they they hire somebody this is a targeted pet tax cut that will actually be of value the next one mr. speaker encouraging businesses to make investments by extending 100 percent business expensing into 2012 this extension would put an additional 85 billion in the hands of businesses next year the third thing mr. speaker that I think is important to 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 mention is helping the unemployed with pathway pathways back to work some people like to refer to our our social safety net I think it's much more effective to refer to it as our social safety trampoline that is when you fall down America caring compassionate nation that we are provides a way for people to bounce back and this is what this third element of the American Jobs Act does returning heroes offering tax cuts to encourage businesses to hire unemployed veterans now I know that there are some Republicans who would vote for this provision they got to be businesses that hire veterans who have been unemployed for six months or longer would receive a tax credit up to five thousand six hundred dollars and that credit rises to nine thousand six hundred for veterans who have a service connected disability now I just gotta believe that there are a few Republicans who would give a green vote to a good piece of legislation like that in the same vein of helping our unemployed the most innovative reform to the unemployment insurance uh, program in 40 years as part of the extension of the unemployment insurance to prevent five million Amer Americans looking for work from losing their benefits the president's plan includes innovative work-based reforms to prevent layoffs and give states greater flexibility to use unemployment insurance funds to best support job seekers and connect them to work including in this innovative program things like this work sharing unemployment insurance for workers whose employers choose work sharing over layoffs second improve reemployment services for long-term unemployed through counseling eligibility assessments three new bridge to work program a plan builds on and improves innovative state programs where uh, those displaced take temporary voluntary or
pursue on-the-job training. So, Mr. Speaker, I'm now about at the end of my time tonight. This has been the Congressional Progressive Caucus, and we, we are here with the progressive message, which we like to come to as often as we can. Um, and uh, what we're talking about tonight is standing up for the rights of women. Uh, more than 50% of Americans are female. My daughter is one of them. And I just want to, 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 to argue that for this country to rise to its full measure of greatness, we have to have full and equal rights for everybody, especially women. Today, there was an there was a, a attack on women's rights and constitutional rights today. There also have been assaults to programs that disproportionately uh, women rely on, like Medicare, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, but also uh, employment sectors that women are employed in, such as the public sector. This is too bad, and we need to stand up against it. But also, jobs. Instead of dealing with divisive social issues where Americans of honestly held conscience disagree very severely on this issue of pro-choice, pro-life, instead of dealing with these old issues, these old things that we've been fighting over for years and will probably never be solved, why don't we talk about jobs? And so, and so we, I, we did go into the American Jobs Act tonight, where we talked about the key parts of this important bill by President Obama. First, investing in our infrastructure and in our people's skills. Second, targeted tax breaks designed to put people back to work, not just giveaways to the rich. And third, help for the unemployed. Three very important features which I believe will really help America. All we want, Mr. Speaker, is a chance to debate these issues on the House floor. Bring amendments. We can bring these amendments. We can debate them. We can vote some up, vote some down. But it's just wrong to deny the American people a chance to get a good jobs bill, Mr. Speaker. So tonight I just want to wrap up by saying that it's always a pleasure to come before the, the House uh, and discuss critical issues facing the American people. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, sir. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5th, 2011, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gohmert, is recognized for one hour as the designee of the Majority Leader. Mr. Gohmert. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do appreciate um, the opinions of our friends across the aisle and those who have spoken here tonight. Um, and I know we both have similar goals, get people back to work. But when I hear my colleague across the aisle say Republicans keep proposing plans that approve failures, the truth is the failures that Republicans have supported <laughs> were, the, were the things that uh, our Democratic friends were in favor of. Um, I sure like President George W. Bush, but in January of 2008, he took a page right out of the Democrats' playbook, proposed a $160 billion stimulus, $40 billion of which went as rebates to people that didn't pay any income tax. So you have people giving rebates that didn't put any bait in. Um, that money really didn't do any good. And then we come around and end up in late September, early October of 2008, having, unfortunately, the Treasury Secretary appointed by a Republican pull a page out of the Democratic playbook and help the uh, folks on Wall Street that contribute and vote four to one for Democrats over Republicans. Um, bailed them out. Some of us made clear you don't 
abandon free market principles to try to save the free market. If you have to abandon free market principles to save the market, it's not worth saving. Trouble is, we'd gotten away from free market principles, and that's why we were in trouble. We had friends across the aisle that were demanding that loans be made to people that couldn't afford the loans. We had friends across the aisle that were, were verifying here in this room and in other hearing rooms that, my golly, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they were healthy, there were no problems when it turned out they were rotting from the inside. Um, so apparently, uh, as smart as my dear friends are across the aisle, they have not been taught history very well. The things that have failed are the very things that are being proposed again. The $700 billion wasn't enough, and actually President Bush's uh, Treasury Secretary, the second worst uh, Treasury Secretary in the history of our country, uh, exceeded only now recently by Secretary Geithner uh, in, in just how poor a job has been done. Um, but that uh, they spent maybe 300, 250 billion of the 700 billion. So the Obama administration got around 400, 450 billion dollars of that 700 billion dollars. President Bush um, uh, unfortunately listened to Chicken Little Paulson as he ran around saying the financial sky was falling. And uh, th that ended up all going to President Obama and Secretary Geithner for them to squander, which they have. Um, and basically used it as a slush fund, in fact. Then, then we're told we have got to build bridges, we've got to do infrastructure. How could anybody disagree with infrastructure? Well, most of us didn't agree, disagree with doing infrastructure that, as long as it was governmental functions. Trouble is, the president had $400, $450 billion from TARP still left over, asked for $800 billion on top of that, and then it turned out that $800 billion may have been closer to a trillion by the time they got around to having what was available under the bill. Of course, $0.42 cents out of every dollar of that was borrowed, much of it from uh, our fr friends and neighbors across the, country, uh, across the world in China. But here again, these governmental giveaways the governmental rebates to people that didn't put any bait in, the giving more and more money to entities that were not creating jobs, the fiascos like Solyndra, and, and I understand even after Solyndra, um, Leader Reed down the hall was able to procure another $700 million for uh, a similar company in Nevada. I mean, this is insane. My friends were just saying in the last hour that Republicans keep proposing plans that approve failures. The failures of Republicans are when we adopt the Democratic strategies on these things. It's time to get back to the principles on which our government was founded. It's very basic, very simple. You give equal opportunities to people to excel. You stop paying people to fail, and we can get this country going again. Now, we also had a bill today that was finally going to allow people to exercise their First Amendment rights. There's a not supposed to be under the Constitution under the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, the government's forcing people to practice religion that is entirely opposite from the religion they believe. So we passed a bill here in the House that would allow health care providers who believe with all their heart, soul, and mind, most of them it's a religious conviction, that to conduct an abortion 
and to take and kill a baby in utero, remove him, kill the baby in utero, out of utero, that it is wrong. And having had our, my wife's and my first child um, come eight to ten weeks prematurely and sitting by her isolate for eight hours, it was supposed to be only two, but I couldn't leave and they didn't make me until I'd been there for eight hours. With that little child, her hand clutching to the end of my finger, she was hanging on to life. The doctor pointed out, look at the monitors. They've stabilized since she's been holding on to you. She's drawing strength. She's drawing life from you. That tiny preemie, my daughter, trying to cling to life. And my friends across the aisle condemning people like me or health care providers who think it's wrong to take that life when they just want to cling to life. Give them a chance. And I was a little surprised, a bit embarrassed uh, for our minority leader, Pelosi, when she said here on Capitol Hill about that bill that would allow people to practice their religious beliefs and not kill uh, babies. The quote from our former Speaker Pelosi was, quote, under this bill, when Republicans vote for this bill today, they will be voting to say that women can die on the floor and health care providers do not have to intervene. Well, there's good news for former Speaker Pelosi, we didn't vote to allow women to die on the floor and health care providers do not have to intervene. That did not happen, and yet the bill passed. Good news, apparently the Speaker did not read the bill. She didn't know that what this allows is a health care provider not to have to kill a baby if it's against their religious beliefs. And also, no women will be allowed to die on the floor. If they do, there will be severe and dire consequences for any health care provider that allows that to happen. There is nobody, despite the former speaker's contentions here on Capitol Hill, there is nobody that voted for that bill today that would, in their wildest nightmares, want a woman to die on the floor without a health care provider intervening, and the bill doesn't do that. So whatever nightmarish bill the speaker was referring to when she thought she was talking about the bill we passed today. Good news for her. She didn't know what she was talking about. Uh, it does not allow women to die on the floor. It just allows people who believe with all their heart, mind, and soul, and their religious beliefs, that killing a baby is wrong. That when that baby wants to cling to life, as my little girl was clinging to my finger and her heart rate stabilized and her breathing stabilized, they can live. They don't have to be killed. They don't have to be killed in utero. Um, it's good news. It's a, it's, it's a great thing. And I hope that the Senate will pass it and not be dissuaded by those who misread the bill, maybe they were reading some disaster book or something, because obviously they were not reading the bill that we passed. Now, there is uh, also a real easy fix to establish cuts in the federal budget, and it would be so great if our colleagues down the aisle, the uh, Senate, and our colleagues across the aisle, the Democrats would take the fact that this House agreed to cut our own budgets 
our own budgets in this legislative session by 5% and say, hey, rest of the, the federal government, look what we have done. We've not talked about it. We, we did it, but we haven't really talked about it. And the truth is, by Congress, by the House at least, cutting our legislative budgets by 5% this year, and as I understand it, we're going to cut 6% next year, it gives us the moral authority to say every federal department in this government, Congress has cut, or at least the House, has cut our own budgets by 5% this year. You're going to, every one of you, cut your budgets by 5% next year. We have the moral authority to do it because we've done it. Now, maybe the Senate doesn't want to do that, but it's the morally responsible thing to do. And then if it comes through and we do cut our legislative budget here 6% in the House, we have the moral authority to say, hey, federal government, every department, every agency, we have cut our own budgets 5% last year, 6% next year. So you're going to cut 5% next year and 6% the year after that. It's 11% cut. Now we're on the right track. And if you don't want to cut some in, invaluable program, there's good news. Cut it off some program that's a waste. My friend Daniel Webster from Florida had been looking into the different transportation agencies that provide rides to people to get their, their place of uh, appointments, whether it's with the VA, whether it's with a doctor, whether it's with the federal government, different agencies, 85 different groups provide rides. How could that be? Well, the rules, the way they were set up in 1974 by a Democratic Congress that also set up the screwy CBL rules that do not allow a good score for things that really do help the country, uh, that same time, they were also busy sticking different agencies that do the same thing in different committees so that we have massive duplications of those type things. Well, all we've got to do is start cutting those things out. And I hope and pray that before I leave Congress, this body and the one down the hall will have the courage to step up and say, you know what? I know I've been on my committee for a number of years, and I've got seniority, and I know this committee is critical, and this committee is critical, but it's time to reform the committee process. And the only way that we'll ever be able to completely eliminate or come close to eliminating all the massive duplication, replication of the same program, spending massive amounts of money to do the same thing, and yet we could combine those and save trillions of dollars over the next 10 years. Uh, we need to have a welfare committee. We take the food stamps out of the ag budget. People hear how big the agriculture budget is, and they just can't believe it. They're not that many farmers. They don't know between 70 and 80 percent of the ag budget goes for food stamps. Let's put that in the welfare committee. You know, Robert Rector over at the Heritage Foundation has done fantastic work, and he was telling me it takes him two years to find all the hidden welfare provided from all the different subcommittees, all the different agency budgets. It takes two full years to do that. It's time to change things here. And I realize that with a Democratic-controlled Senate, it's not going to happen this session. But I hope and pray that the, the next session of the Senate that begins in January of 2013 will have people in the House and the Senate, regardless of their party, that will finally reform the government here in Washington, and to use the President's words, fundamentally change the way we do business so that we don't set ourselves up to provide massive amounts of waste, fraud, and abuse. Now, it helps 
to reform government if the people here in Washington who vote on the bills and down Pennsylvania Avenue who sign bills or veto bills actually read them. Wow, what a concept. It would help if the president himself, before he had gone out on the road condemning Congress for not passing his American Jobs Act, had actually had an American Jobs Act written. But after he spoke here on this floor, Mr. Speaker, he went around the country spending millions and millions of dollars. Some say it was campaigning. Whatever he was doing, he was condemning Congress for not passing a bill that didn't exist. Did so that weekend. Did so on Monday. Monday evening, they finally had a bill, and I got it uh, printed out. But it turns out nobody was filing it. And yet that didn't stop the president from running around saying we would refuse him to pass a bill, pass this bill right away, right now. Nobody bothered to file it. In fact, if he had taken 10 minutes out of his schedule, run around the country spending millions of dollars condemning us for not passing his bill, to have picked up the phone and called one of his Democratic friends here in the House and said, hey, hey, I'm running around the country condemning Republicans for not passing my bill. I'm embarrassed. Nobody filed the bill. I forgot to ask anybody over there to, pass, to file the bill so that you could pass it. So how about filing my bill? Didn't bother to do that. Just kept running around the country condemning us for not passing his bill. By Wednesday, that's when I realized if the President of the United States, who obviously had not read his bill, which I did, entire bill, clearly from the things he said about the bill, he hadn't read it at all, um, I decided, you know what, if he's going to condemn us for not passing the American Jobs Act, there ought to be one. So I filed one. And I was flexible. I sat here on the floor. I'd be willing to negotiate. And it would create jobs because it deals with an insidious tariff of 35% that we put on every American-made company's goods here, which keeps them from being able to compete globally because nobody else in the world slaps that kind of tariff on their own goods produced in their country. We're doing it to ourselves. And then the insidious part is that the American public has been convinced by people here in Washington, hey, hey, it's a corporate tax, so you don't have to pay it. Of course they pay it. The corporations are nothing but a collection agent. And the way the crony capitalism has been working around this town the only way you get out of paying corporate taxes or the massive tariffs so you can compete globally is if you've got a friend down at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue or in the Senate, perhaps, because friends of those here in the House are not faring so well. They're having to pay taxes. But if you are an entity like General Electric and you're close friends with the president, you really enjoy each other's company, the top executives and the president, good news. You're probably going to get out of paying any taxes, no matter how many billions you make. So why not level the playing field, which would bring back manufacturing jobs? And I'm surprised the unions are not all for this. It would bring back union manufacturing jobs in massive numbers back to this country. And I know there's a lot of envi environmentalists in the United States who really don't want the manufacturing jobs back. Even though they provide good union jobs, folks that would probably vote Democrat, they don't want them back because they think somehow, and it's really unbelievable they think this, but they think somehow by driving those manufacturing jobs out of the United States and into countries that pollute four to ten times more producing the same products as there was added to the atmosphere here that somehow they've helped the environment, not realizing that that pollution goes up in the air and the way the world turns. We get an awful lot of that Chinese pollution right here in our own country. Even though we don't have the jobs, we don't have the tax revenue from those, we suffer the consequences of having run those com companies out.
So we get all of the disadvantages of running them out and none of the advantages. And we hurt our economy. We hurt our ability to prepare for any type of defense that may be necessary to those who want to destroy us. Because anybody that knows history knows a country that is looked to as the secure and protector of freedom must be able to provide all of the things that it would need in a battle within its own country. And if it can't do that, it's not going to last very long as the protector of freedom, which means freedom won't last very much longer. Now, the president talked about his bill so much, and, and it would be easy to be very cynical since the president went on the road and, and went for six days before there was ever American Jobs Act filed, which was my bill. Uh, it might be easy, easy to become cynical and say, it doesn't sound like the president had any intention of ever getting the bill voted on. All he wanted to do was run around the country and condemn Republicans when this was some kind of political game. He had no intention of uh, that bill being pushed, even being filed. There is a dramatically important piece of evidence that would seem to establish irrefutably that leader Harry Reid and the president were not serious at all about his bill passing. What would that piece of evidence be? Well, it would start with Article 1, Section 7 of the United States Constitution, which says all bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives, but the Senate may propose or concur with amendments as on other bills. The critical part was all bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives. Well, not hard to find from the president's bill that he's raising revenue, he's raising taxes, so clearly under the Constitution, no question about it, the president's bill has to originate in the House. No question about it. It raises revenue. Everybody knows that. Leader Reid knows that. So when I heard that finally the president's bill was passed in the Senate, or, or not passed, but filed in the Senate, then I knew, because I know something about the Constitution, well, that has to be a House bill. The president is popping people with extra tax, raises revenue, so obviously it has to originate in the House. Now, normally, unless there were games played in this town, that would mean the bill starts here, and we would take up the president's bill, and if it passed, then the Senate would take it up. But over the years, both parties apparently have played a political game where if the Senate wants to start a bill that raises revenue, they will take a House bill that is already passed, strip it out of every word, and substitute for all that language of the House bill the Senate bill. And then under the gamesmanship up here in Congress, that's been considered to satisfy the requirements of the Constitution because technically the bill started in the House. It has a House bill number on it. And so it did start in the House. They just took out every word and then put in the Senate bill. And from a practical standpoint, it originated in the Senate. But from a technical standpoint, since it has a House number on it, then obviously they slide by under the gamesmanship here by saying it's a House bill. And in fact, that's exactly what happened with Obamacare. The House had not passed a bill that the Senate would take up uh, on health care back two years ago. 
So what the Senate did was take a House bill, H.R. 3590, and this is the actual name of the Obamacare health bill. It's entitled, and, and I've got the um, first volume of the two volumes uh, that make up the 24 or 500 pages of the president's uh, uh, health care so-called bill. But anyway, it's H.R. 3590 entitled, quote, An Act to Amend the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 to Modify the First-Time Home Buyers Credit in the Case of Members of the Armed Forces and certain other federal employees, and for other purposes, unquote. Obamacare is H.R. 3590, and it was a bill the House of Representatives passed, mainly to help our veterans, to help our armed services, our members who have pledged their lives, their fortunes, their sacred honor, to serve in our military, it's mainly what it's for, and give them a tax credit for the first time purchase of a home. Just seems so cold hearted to have taken a bill that started out to help veterans and our armed services members. And beginning with line one, page one, and strip out every single word of the bill to help our veterans and substitute therein Obamacare, 25, 24, 500 pages. But that's what they did because that was the game. Because they knew in the Senate if they were going to pass a bill that raised revenue under Article One, Section 7 of the Constitution, they had to take a House bill so they could play the game of saying, well, it did originate in the House, has a House number on it, House title on it. We just stripped all that language out and put our bill in. That's the only way that the president's so-called jobs bill could originate in the Senate practically is to take a House bill, strip out every word, keep the House bill number, keep the House bill title, and put the president's so-called jobs bill in there. So the only way that bill could ever have a chance of becoming law. And Leader Reed knows that. He's a smart man. And from what I understand, the, the, pre, the president at one time was a, a local instructor in a law school, and surely he had to have read the Constitution and understand that. So he would know, as would Leader Reed, that for the president's jobs bill to meet the constitutional requirement of Article I, Section 7, then Leader Reed would have to strip out a House bill. So when I heard that Leader Reed had filed the president's so-called jobs bill, I directed my staff to find out what House bill, what House bill number, and what House bill title that Leader Reed had stripped every word out of and substituted therein the president's so-called jobs bill. And I found the answer. He didn't do that. Leader Reed filed the president's bill with no co-sponsors. little trivia. The American Jobs Act, uh, my bill, I think it's got five co-sponsors. The president's so-called jobs bill, zero co-sponsors. Mr. Reed filed it. It is, Mr. Speaker, it is S-1549. That's a Senate number, S-1549. That's a Senate bill. Leader Reed did not bother to do what would be required, even under the gamesmanship of Capitol Hill, to strip out a House bill. And there's only one reason he wouldn't do that. There's only one reason the president wouldn't request that he do that. 
and that is because they had no intention of that bill, this bill, ever passing. Now, I've only got the first few pages because the, the, uh, the president's bill is actually 155 pages I have here, but that came before I got a copy of that before it was ever filed by anybody. So then I heard that Leader Reed had actually filed an amendment to the president's so-called jobs bill, and I thought, ah, now he's no longer going to play this ridiculous charade of acting like he wants a bill to pass that he knows could never become law because it originated in the Senate, doesn't have a House bill number. So, okay, he's, he's filed an amendment. The new bill has surely got to be uh, some House bill that was stripped of every word. But it turns out that was Senate bill number 1660. Still a Senate number. It is still originating in the Senate. There's not even the charade facade being, uh, being shown here which makes very, very clear. Senator Reid and President Obama never, ever intended for the so-called jobs bill of the president to pass. Never intended for it to pass. They never did. Smokescreen is all this has been for weeks now. Millions and millions and millions of dollars running around the country demanding we pass a bill that neither Leader Reid nor the president had any intention of ever having passed because they knew the way the procedure works here, when a bill like this that raises revenue originates in the Senate and the Senate were to actually pass it, then the Senate clerk would send it to the House would go to our clerk, and they would review it, and they would find that it raises revenue, as the president, Leader Reid, know and acknowledge. And they would do what's called blue slipping it. They put a blue slip on it, in essence, saying the House cannot take up the Senate bill because it raises revenue. And that means under Article 1, Section 7, it must originate in the House, and therefore it's being sent back to the Senate without any action whatsoever, because obviously people at the other end of the hall were playing some kind of game. Knowing that a bill that raised revenue that originated in the Senate and did not have a House number, did not have a House title, would never become law it was all a game. All a game. And apparently the goal of this political game, played by the president and leader Reid, has as a goal the president winning the game, the political game, and getting reelected, and the American people losing because there was no bill that was ever seriously intended to pass by the president or leader Reid. That is tragic, simply tragic. The American people suffer, people losing their jobs, and the only reason that the, the um, unemployment rate did not de raise one more time again, that it stayed at 9.1 percent, that disastrous rate, was because so many uh, employees who had been out on strike came back on to work. If they had not done that, then the unemployment rate would have reflected the truth. This country is still in big trouble, all while the president travels around making speeches about passing a bill that neither he nor Leader Reid had never any intention of passing and becoming law as the American people suffer. Now, I heard my friends across the aisle here tonight say they wish, in essence, that the Republicans would bring their jobs bill. Well, there's great news. Apparently, while my friends hadn't noticed, we have passed about a dozen bills out of this body 
and sent them down to Leader Reed that will create jobs across the country, will bring down the price of gasoline, will bring down the price of energy, all kinds of bills we've sent down there, and they're sitting in the Senate. So for all of those people who have said the president is flat wrong when he says that we have a do-nothing Congress, and as he's traveling around this week saying there's a do-nothing Congress, I'm going to defend the president here. For those that say the president's completely wrong when he says it's a do-nothing Congress, well, I'm going to defend the president. And I stand up for him because the president, when he says there's a do-nothing Congress, is one-half right. And he ought to be acknowledged for being one-half right when he says there's a do-nothing Congress because there is a do-nothing Senate. They're sitting on bills that would create jobs, bring down energy prices, and would bring jobs back to America, easing the burdens that have sent companies fleeing from this country to South America, to China, to India, to other countries. We bear them no ill will, but we want our jobs back here in America. And how wonderful to have the president's big jobs are as a guy who has sent thousands and thousands of jobs from his own company overseas. Well, he apparently knows what he's doing because since he's been our jobs are for President Obama, we've had thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands more jobs continue to flee and go across to other countries. He knows what he's doing. He did it with his own company, and now we're continuing to have that happen with other companies. Well, obviously, since the president, based on the things he said about his so-called jobs bill, has not read the bill clearly, that's how we know he's not misrepresenting things. He just doesn't know what his bill says. And in fairness, he could not possibly know what his bill says because he was on the road for four or five days the whole time the bill was being written, demanding we pass a bill that hadn't even been written. But... Uh, I'll just flip through some of the provisions here. We're told once again, just like we were in January of 2009, that we must pass the president's bill, just like in 2009, because it's going to provide bridges and infrastructure. I I'm surprised that in, in two and a half short years, the president was thinking people would have already forgotten that he used that sales pitch to sell a nearly trillion-dollar bill that didn't do anything he said it would. And then I found out today, my friend uh, Mick Mulvaney pointed out this morning that when adjusted for inflation to the current level today, Every interstate highway in this country had $425 billion spent in total to construct all the interstate highways we have in the country. Yet the president in January of 2009 talked about creating all these new roads and infrastructure and bridges, and yet there was only a tiny fraction of all that money that was used at all on such infrastructure. And if he had taken half of that money and used it on infrastructure, we could have had an entirely new interstate highway system to mirror the one that we already have. Amazing. The kind of money that was squandered with nothing to show for it. That's the embarrassing part. If we had more people employed today than ever before, then even though it was an abandonment of free market principles, I would have to be grateful that there were new jobs and people were employed. You want to help people? Let them get a job that was not a giveaway from some government agency. Let them earn their own keep. For those of us that believe the Bible, I don't try to shove my religious beliefs 
on anyone else, but for those of us who do believe the Bible, you can look. Before there was a fall from grace, before there was such a thing as some people call sin was ever introduced into the world by improper choices, God gave Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, but Adam and Eve, a job. He said, tend the garden. They were in a perfect paradise when there were no thorns, no sweat, a perfect paradise. People had a job, tend the garden. A job is a good thing. It builds self-esteem, and it allows people to give of themselves to help others. Not to come to Washington and use and abuse taxing authority to take other people's money to give to our favorite charity, but for individuals to be blessed because they earned money at their own job and then helped people. And I believe the Creator knew how much good that did our hearts, minds, and souls to earn something and then help ourselves, others who need it. That's not what you find in the president's so-called jobs bill. Just when we thought, surely Washington had learned a big, big lesson about the disaster when the federal government starts getting into the business of financing things, we have the president proposing what he calls the America Infrastructure Financing Authority. Page 40. It's another massive bureaucracy. Who would control it? Oh, well, it's, it's a financing authority, so maybe it's not run by the government like Fannie and Freddie had government fingerprints all over them, all over the some of the worst problems. Maybe, maybe the president learned the lesson from the damage done to this country by Fannie and Freddie being improperly managed. But then you can turn the page, page 41, and see, oh, well, the board of directors of the American Infrastructure Financing Authority consists of seven voting members appointed by the president. Well... How about that? How about that? I guess the president didn't learn his lesson. He thinks the government is still the way to go about not only funding housing for 100, 200, 300,000 or so, but now we'll fund billions of dollars in infrastructure financing. Stand good for that. Ironically, just as in the president's stimulus bill, so-called, in January of 2009, where the president promised all this great infrastructure, and turned out it was just a tiny bit of infrastructure compared to the overall amount, we find he's done the same thing in this new so-called jobs bill. There's a little bit of money for infrastructure, but compared to $450 billion it is a tiny drop in the bucket. Well, there's a little revenue generated here by, by auctioning off some broadband spectrum. Um, oh, and I, I see there are provisions here where the public will relinquish some of its licenses. Other people will relinquish different things. I always hate to see that word when the government makes people relinquish things, but the language is there. But then what we get by selling off a, a little bit of broadband spectrum is found at page 75 of the president's bill called the Public Safety Broadband Network. If individuals in this country were disappointed that the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, did not totally control the airwaves the way they wanted them to. Maybe they wished there had been a fairness doctrine that had been reinstated. Maybe they wanted the federal government to just exercise with an iron fist uh, its authority 
which I think would be unconstitutional, but to limit speech, well, then people would have to be encouraged by this new entity, the Public Safety Broadband Network, because it will take over the broadband for us. But not to worry, we call it a corporation, so it won't be government, right? Well, wrong. You look at page 76, even though it says it will be established a private nonprofit corporation, turns out the members of the board will be the Secretary of Commerce, Secretary of Homeland Security, Attorney General of the United States, Director of Office of Management and Budget, and they will go about appointing 11 more individuals to serve as non-federal members of the board. Well, happy days. Happy days. More and more government. And it's interesting, there's a little money for a reemployment program. How many reemployment programs are we going to throw money away on to train people for jobs that don't exist? How about allowing the public sector to have that money, which is not available to borrow when the federal government is sucking that money out of the use by the private sector? It's not there to be borrowed and built, uh, used to build up companies, to build up jobs, create jobs. Oh, no. The federal government is taking it to build more government, more training programs for jobs that don't exist. And then there's a new program here at 106 that most people had never heard about, and I really doubt that the president knows it's here. It's a new program entitled Short-Term Compensation Program, and it, it does say that it's initially voluntary, but it also says if an employer reduces the number of hours worked by employees in lieu of layoffs, so for example, where an employer, and I've had people tell me they were doing this, they didn't want to lose their valuable employees, but business was terrible. So they all agreed among themselves they would take a reduction in hours, a reduction in pay, so they could save the company, weather the storm, maybe get to January 2013 when the economy would rebound because we'd have new free market principles put into place. Things would take off, and then everybody could go back to making an even better living. Well, under this provision, if you're part of the president's new pr program and you reduced by at least 10%, the hours of your employees, then according to subsection 3, those employees would be eligible for unemployment compensation. That means the unemployment tax rate for that employer would go, out, uh, would go up. And I've heard from employers who said, if you raise my unemployment tax rate, I'm going to have to lay off a whole lot of employees instead of being able to save the company, save their jobs, and weather this storm. And it does say on down the page under subsection 7, uh, if an employer provides health benefits and retirement benefits under a defined benefit plan, uh, then the state agency is required to certify that such benefits will continue to be supported provided, which means for the employers I talk to who are struggling just trying to hold on, they're not going to be able to hold on. They're going to have to keep providing benefits at the same level. They're trying to weather the storm. And that's what companies normally do just to survive. That's what individual mom and pop operations do. They cut their budget. Not here in Washington. One of the best things I've heard all year is when Chairman Ryan said the vision he has for our budget includes finally adopting a zero baseline budget. And I am so grateful to Chairman Ryan. He sees the same thing I do. We need to have a zero baseline budget. In other words, no automatic increases. Started in 1974, it's time it quit. Because a mom and pop operation, a mom operation, a pop operation, any operation, any business. When times are tough, they have to cut. Not here in Washington. Under the rules set up in 1974, there's a formula. So we have automatic increases every year. 
It's time to stop it. If, a, if an agency's going to get additional money, they need to prove that they should get it. But as I started off this hour, Mr. Speaker, saying this House has adopted a budget that cut our legislative budgets by 5% across the board. It's time we exercise our moral authority and said everybody else in the federal government is going to have to have the same kind of 5% cut across the board. And when we do that 6% to our budget next year, it's time to demand after we do it in the House, everybody else in the federal government has to do it too. Now, there are... Um, there's so many other provisions that have nothing to do with creating jobs. And you can look at page 134 and see that the president, who's talked about all these millionaires and billionaires needing to pay their fair share, even though we're now approaching 50% of the country that will not pay income tax. If the president believes what he says, Mr. Speaker, it is time to call the bluff and say, all right, then let's have a flat tax Everybody pays the same amount. It doesn't matter if you're a ultra zillionaire, billionaire, if you're one of the poorer workers. Everybody is going to have an investment, as the president likes to say, in this government, and that way they'll have more interest in what happens. They'll have more interest in seeing we don't waste so much money up here. And we can do that. But this is why I'm sure also the president never read, read the bill that he demands we pass, that I uh, explained earlier why we know now neither the president nor Leader Reed had any intention of this bill passing, so they didn't bother to meet the constitutional requirements. But at page 135, the president's bill defines what he's been calling a billionaire and millionaire as a taxpayer whose adjusted gross income is above, see, in the case, $125,000 in the case of married filing separately, 250000 in the case of, of joint return. But if you're a gay couple living together, then you can be grateful to the president because you can claim 200000 or $225,000 as your exemption amount. But even at that rate, now, I'm from East Texas, and the public schools I went to were awfully good. But they taught me that when a number has six figures in it, it isn't a million and it isn't a billion. So when the president's bill says 125000 if you're married, that's the exemption you've got before they start slapping you with extra tax. And... and I haven't heard anybody else but me talk about this, but down subsection C on page 135, not only does the president not do away with the alternative minimum tax, as the title says, there's an additional AMT amount in the president's bill. Now, there's a jobs bill. People, you call them millionaires and billionaires and define it as somebody that makes $125,000. You slap them with extra alternative minimum tax. You take away deductions. I'm telling you, Mr. Speaker, it is time that we had a flat tax across the board. Everybody would pay their fair share. And if you, the more money you make on a flat tax, the more money you're going to pay in. And I agree with Art Laffer, who was telling me, there is a, a strong justification for two deductions only, the interest, mortgage interest deduction, and charitable contribution deduction. All the others go away. Now, that would be a fair tax. Everybody would pay their fair share. And since the president's not aware of how oil companies work, and since they've spent more and more and more money than ever in the Interior Department budget uh, to consider permits to drill for oil or gas, and we've gone from 140-something permits that cost a whole lot less to process to now processing double-digit permits, um, we're losing jobs. I hear from people in the Gulf affected by the Deepwater Horizon explosion by the president's good friends at British Petroleum who were all set to 
endorse the president's cap and trade bill before the blowout, and then they had to postpone that. But um, when you eliminate deductions that only keep independent oil companies alive, then it doesn't affect the majors in it only one way, and that is you drive out all the independent producers, the majors will be able to charge more than ever. They'll make more profit than ever. Mr. Speaker, how many